Hello and welcome to First Christian Church's Adult Fellowship Bible Study. We continue in our study of the last few chapters of the New Testament book of Revelation. Last time we covered chapter 19 which focused on the heavenly hallelujahs and in the last half of that chapter uh, the rider on the white horse. Following that chapter comes one of the most controversial passages in the New Testament and particularly in Revelation uh, report a number of scholars. It is a brief description of a 1,000 year messianic reign on earth. Dr. Christopher Rowland of Queens College Oxford writes that during that period Satan will be bound so he cannot influence people's thinking. The millennial kingdom will be presided over by Christ and Christian martyrs but it ends with a release of Satan. A final war against the enemies, uh, enemy nations called uh, Gog and Magog then followed by another vision of judgment called the Great White Throne Judgment. Several scholars remind us not to consider these visions as a chronological order of things at the end of the world, but rather as a series of separate visions by John about the end. John opens his 20th chapter here with a vision of another angel descending from heaven. This angel has a keys to the abyss, which means a bottomless chasm or a bottomless pit. Uh, the angel seizes Satan and binds him up for a thousand years in that abyss. Dr. Bruce Metzger, a Princeton theological, taught that in John's Mindset, it seems, that he thinks that God has finally turned his attention to his ultimate enemy, the great deceiver. Notice John tells you why this has happened. He says, so that the nations will no longer be deceived. Thus, John's focus here is on national deception and not just individual deception. Why? Because John has made it clear earlier in Revelation that the devil or Satan had been given the authority, uh, had given his authority uh, to the nations and their leaders and those cooperating specifically with Rome as his agents. So scholars add here that in, in the Greek, this word here that's translated nations is, has the same roots, the word that's here in Greek anyway, as heathens or pagans. Thus, it does not include, when he's referring to this type of nation, would not include God's selected people, Israel. Therefore, the purpose seems to have a period of reversing uh, the bondage by which humans are being held under by the beast and uh, Babylon, or the pagans, if you will, uh, and freeing up the earth's inhabitants to follow the way of God. Dr. Eugene Boring, Professor Emeritus, at Texas Christian University teaches that <coughs> excuse me that this binding of Satan story that's here is a standalone and separate vision from the millennium but they do intermix he says its motif is found in the apocalyptic traditions well before it appears in the New Testament this binding of Satan came into Judaism from the Persian religion. We see it then emerging in Isaiah 24, 
where the powers of evil will be gathered together and imprisoned in a pit, at least temporarily holding cell, if you will. Its biggest appearance in Judaism, uh, eschatology, however, is in the apocalyptic writings, which occurred after, for the most part, after the closing of most of our Old Testament. and mostly before the New Testament was written. It also occurs not just in Revelation in the New Testament, but also is exposed in Mark, Second Peter, and Jude. In a way, he says, it tends to be a vision of the end itself. It eliminates Satan's influence and humans and gods can and God can unite in a common understanding, says Boring. Therefore, several scholars note that this binding of Satan is to allow people and nations to make free will decisions without the influence of Satan and his agents. Implied here is that most humans will obey God's will when freed of that influence of Satan. Also implied here is that it is God who has allowed Satan to operate and he's also given humans free will. Thus it is God that must remove this influential deceiver and this corrupt system that has interfered with humans who are actually just trying to survive. The survival instincts are strong in human nature and powerful and the average human with free will cannot withstand the influences of Satan is an assumption that's there. The alternative was what John has been presenting to be martyred. Therefore this one visionary idea that John has here, they say, is, is an idea of hope. A hope that evil will be removed long enough to allow the human mind to establish clear thinking and become obedient to God's will. Dr. David Brackey at Ohio State University says, notice in this millennial vision that it is the members of a particular group that are raised from the dead and not all dead as so many religious groups tend to surmise. The particular group that is raised from the dead here uh, is important. It's the souls of the martyr, those martyred for, Christ, uh, for Christ. They come to life and reign with Christ for the 1,000 years. These are the ones that had not worshipped the beast or carried his mark. They are the only ones raised in this particular resurrection in John's vision. The rest of the dead uh, don't come to life until the end of the thousand year reign. It seems to be where he's headed here. Some scholars add this seems to reflect that the first resurrection that started with Christ as the first fruit or the first one now ends with the resurrection of these martyred Christians. This phase for a thousand years that we see here occurs here only in only here in Revelation and a related phrase is found only in one other place in the New Testament and that is in 2nd Peter but in 2nd Peter it seems to refer to a totally different circumstance one in which uh, the, the concept is more related to time that uh, one day is as of a thousand years in God's sight or something to that effect as we learn in our introductory classes, uh, 
several sessions, six or seven sessions we had before we started the individual scriptures and revelation. The views of the millennium have differed widely throughout the Christian movement and still do today. But we will not go into all that variation in detail here. You, you can find that in, the, in our archive uh, tapes where we covered it in somewhat detail in one of those first six lectures. Several scholars say we should note that in chapter 20, by no means does God or does John envision eternal life here but a millennial period of a life with Christ on this earth. In fact, he then envisioned Satan being released at the end of it. But during that 1,000 years, the murdered Christians reign with Christ as priests and kings on earth. This idea is found nowhere else in the New Testament. Dr. Boring adds, nor does it seem to play even a really large role when looked at all of Revelation and John's overall eschatology. It seems this is just one of the ways that John seems to view what is going to happen or is happening at the end. It seems he is envisioning a role specifically for these martyred Christians, separate from all others. Others add more. They say it clearly seems to be here that John is providing an element of hope and motivation for those Christians facing martyrdom and not by any means is he dealing with a uh, salvation view, if you will, for all Christians. Boren notes that the millennial period is not a new idea originating here with Revelation. He says this millennial concept in the old prophetic uh, eschatology in the early parts of the Old Testament, pre-Christian clearly, and even pre uh, more Israelite, he says, than that even later Judaism. This world will end with the evil overcome by God's people. A life of good people, uh, of those good people that are obedient to God will be allowed to rule. They believe it would be in continuity with this world and not someplace else. It would be a historic event for the world to see to prove they were God's people. It would happen not to the individual, but to their people as a whole, as a group, as a nation of Israel. In contrast, apocalyptic eschatology uh, that emerges later and specifically usually referred to as apocalyptic eschatology, saw the world as an entirely overwhelmed place by evil, <coughs> and excuse me, and therefore not savable really. It was too evil to be redeemed. Thus they tended to think of it that a new place, with a totally new place, would have to be developed in in heaven uh, clearly separate, separated from earth that earth would be destroyed and maybe even the current heaven destroyed and totally made anew they did not generally envision the Messiah as from this world either but was a transcendent figure bringing salvation from the other world from a new world that is it does not grow out of this world, but is created totally new for this purpose. And that seems to be the idea late in Judaism prior to, by the close, or close to the close of uh, the Maccabean revolts. Thus by John's time, 
which is a couple hundred years later than that, first century AD, it appears a hybrid scheme may have emerged, says Boring. He seems to be leaning heavily on Ezekiel, uh, however, here. These earliest Christians, Dr. Christian Rowland teaches, clearly resorted to the apocalyptic language and ideas that were in vogue uh, in late Judaism. They seem to believe they were the very ones that these early Christians were living at the very time in which this event would, would happen, whatever it was, the coming to the end. That would happen actually in their lifetime, not in some distant future. He says even Paul reflects that in the in First Corinthians. But scholars tend to univer almost universally. There's few exceptions to it in mainline scholarship, anyway. That the millennial concept in eschatology has been much disputed and debated, and especially. Uh, this idea that it is perceived differently by Jews versus Christians. In general, many Jewish scholars today argue that Judaism perceives redemption as a physical event that takes place uh, to a social, in a social, public, and historical setting, or stage, if you will. Dr. G. Uh, Skokum, who was an Israelite scholar at Hebrew University, uh, I think he died sometime maybe around 1980. He's been dead a good while, but he's a well-renowned philosopher and theologian, or I should say maybe more, rather than theologian, uh, religious scholar. He wrote a paper entitled Messianic Ideas in Israel. In that, he's, he says, that's the concept that they think it would happen on a public stage and would happen to the whole people. In contrast, he says, Christians tend to perceive redemption as an event occurring in the spiritual realm of an individual rather than the physical realm. There's variations of that, but that's kind of where it waters down to, he says. Chapter 20 closes out with the great white throne judgment vision. Dr. Rowland says, the demise of the devil, the beast, and the false prophet, and the enemy nations have paved the way and opened the way for judgment called called the Great White Throne Judgment, a concept from the Old Testament that we see in 1 Kings and in Daniel, and hinted to in some other places. It appears the whole creation of the old has been removed and judgment of the dead takes place here. The books are open for records and most important is the Book of Life, mentioned here several times. All whose names are not in that book are sentenced to an eternity in the lake of fire. Judgment seems according to this work, to one's works, which appears in other books plus clearly Old Testament. Hold, holding fast, the only addition to that is that one must then hold fast in the belief in Jesus Christ and not accept another Messiah. Dr. Bruce Metzger at Princeton taught to note that verse 11, the second half, that there is this idea of eternal purity as heaven and earth are not in the presence of God here. In other words, it's been too corrupted and so it's, it's, there's, there's another level that God himself is finally at. That the Greek here conveys this idea that all dead without respect to person 
are brought before judgment hour, whether their name's in the book or not, they hear their judgment, they hear their sentence, that idea is there. There is no absentee and no exemptions and no special group selected here as there was in the premillennial event. This general judgment uh, of all idea is found in many Middle Eastern cultures, though, predating the New Testament uh, and outside our Bible, that is, outside the Old Testament. Several scholars say it is clear here that this judgment in John's vision does not exclude, I mean, does not exclude one's works being the grounds for judgment as the primary grounds for judgment. And Dr. Boring says that's an important concept that Christians need to appreciate as we tend to try to talk around it, he says. This picture makes human freedom and responsibility as serious as it can get. That what we do on this earth and in our life matters and matters ultimately. Exactly what role that book of life or the Lamb's book of life plays is not clear or completely clear here in John's book of Revelation, except that only ones written in that book qualify to start with. But the works are still there. John does not exclude the works. Early, or John says, their names were placed in that book before creation. So, if works count, several scholars try to envision how it could be. If that be the case, that the names occur in there, about the only reasonable explanation that comes up then is that they envision that maybe if your works don't match or you do something in your works that's unqualifiable, then your name becomes blotted out. Because the idea they believe seems to be that everybody's name was originally in the book of life and that you can get removed from the book of life. That seems to be where the majority, but of course, as we know, there's the predestination uh, theology out there that totally has a different idea. John does not here cover the role of grace. That's missing here so far in Revelation this part of Revelation anyway. That story of grace is elsewhere in the New Testament and especially in Paul's writing. I hope this gives you some idea of how the scholars look at chapter 20, which is a uh, tough, it's tough for them as you read their scholarship. Uh, they have a hard time with it. Uh, this is by far and away that seems to be the most difficult scholarly works of all of Revelation to try to understand so far. But we're not done. We still have two more chapters to go. I hope you uh, have a good week. We'll see you here in the future. Thank you.